take off. Okay, well, thanks to everyone for joining this uh, program. And I, I've enjoyed uh, putting these together. You know, we, we all need interesting things to do in these times, and it's good to have something to do inside. We've been to some degree driven inside by smoke. Less, not so much for me. I don't mind going out, but in any case, I enjoy doing this. So I did have, I had this program from uh, a talk I gave in 2014 for the Conservancy, but I had to redo it, just so you know. I went back through it quite a bit. And I'm much more of a botanist than a zoologist, and this is on wildlife, but I like wildlife as I'm sure all you do. And, and so it's just attractive to anything we can learn about it is, is fun to do. Uh, <clears throat> One thing, I, I might have mentioned this on a previous program, it seems worth saying that uh, there's no way to retain the flow of facts that come from the study of science. There's just too much stuff. Uh, there, I mean, I've been a botanist and there are many things I've learned and now I've forgotten them. <laughs> I mean, there's just too many facts. So I, I, I wanted to say that I think that the point of these programs is more the effect it, it could have on our mind, a state of mind, and I can't create a state of mind, but I can possibly recommend a state of mind that there's a lot going on, that we are part of, we are part of a journey, an evolutionary journey that is infinitely bigger than we are. And I think it's part of the potential enjoyment of being humans to know that, to see that we're part of something bigger and learn something about it and see that it's going on. And part of what I'm saying is that takes us out of our personal problems, <laughs> which have a way of just uh, spinning around in our heads. And it's just pointless to spend all that time on our problems. So uh, it's, there's that. So um, there is an evolutionary journey and we talked about it a bit. Well, we started with rocks and I didn't make as much I, I made the point that the rocks are dynamic and they're moving and we all, most of this information is new in the past 150 years. Geology is new in the past 50 years. It wasn't, plate tectonics was not accepted by the U.S. Geological Association until 1970. I mean, and it is the core of geology. Geology is all about plate tectonics. So this is new information and we're privileged to be alive at this time and learn these things. And so one thing I didn't talk about with geology I thought I would mention is that continental rock has evolved over time. I mentioned that continental rock is different than ocean crust. It's lighter, it has more silica. Well, it didn't always exist. It has evolved over time. We didn't talk about that just because we're limited in time. You could bring it up in comments and I could say more about it. I could write it up a little thing. It's so interesting. How is that possible that rocks could evolve? It's definitely true, definitely true. And uh, plants, we talked about plants and they clearly evolved. There were no plants. There were no plants at all for most of the history of the planet. Then there were, might've been a few plants in the water. They, I'm sure they evolved in water. They, they had to learn how to live, live on land. Same with animals. There were no animals. There, there was no life. We, we have no real idea how life appeared on the planet. I mean, these things are all embedded in mystery, which is good. <laughs> there were no, there were, there were no, was no life. When life appeared, it was single cells. It was bacterial, bacterial life. That's all there was for most of the history. There was no multicellular life. You're going to have a hard time coming up with fish and amphibians and reptiles until there's multicellular life and cells had to learn how to work together. So the point at the moment is we're, this is a dynamic process. It's changing all the time. It continues to change. And part of, you know, part of our angst are the changes that are occurring. But I think it helps to realize, hey, that's the nature of the planet. Uh, so these are two coyote pups. I had a, I had a uh, contract to do a botany survey in the Pipestone area. And I was walking up the lower Pipestone Road with Annika Mines in, in uh, I forget, mm, could be 10 years ago, eight years ago. 
And we went up Side Canyon because we were surveying, a, a place you wouldn't normally go, but it's a nice thing about surveying. And we saw a female coyote run up the hill, and then Annika grabbed my arm and said, look, and I thought it was going to be a rattlesnake. And there were seven little pups piled up on one another up on the hillside, staring down at us. And then they started to run down the hill, and they ran right up to our feet. And then they got scared and turned around and went back. And it was their den. So I went up to the den, and this is a picture I took at the den. And I was, you know, really one of the more delightful wildlife experiences I've ever had. And you can see how unbelievable, it was hard not to grab one of these and bring it home. And I went back the next day to take more pictures, and she had moved them all. She could smell that I had been to the den. I didn't go in the den, of course. And uh, she moved them all, and I never saw them again. Let's see, how's this work, if at all? Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, some of this material I am posting online at the Methow Naturalist, second item on the left, there's two columns there, second item on the left, uh, some of these graphics I'm putting online. So this one is there that we used last week, it's already up. This is the evolutionary characteristics of plants. I know it's, it may not, you know, it's not so fun to look at, but it has the number of these, it, for one thing on the left there, it has what the plant divisions are. We can't remember what they are. It's nice to know how plants have diversified over time, you know, from mosses and club mosses and ferns and uh, ginkgos and cycads. And if you remember, you know, they, and the numbers. So there's the numbers there of how many in the world and how many in the methow. How many ginkgos are there in the world? There's one species of ginkgo, but it's in its own little division there. So that's, if I haven't posted it yet, the rest of these I will post today. I put them into a PDF, but it, you know, getting them online takes time. We have the same thing for vertebrates, evolutionary characteristics of vertebrates, including the number of species in the world. I just find these, uh, you know, I got curious about this and it became very interesting to me how, and I don't, again, don't remember these things. Uh, it, 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 so it goes across from left to right, but number of species in the world, how many fish are in 32,000? How many in the methow? I'm fascinated to know how many species of these organisms there are in the methouse. So there's 26 fish species, seven amphibians, reptiles. Look at all the birds. So for some reason, birds. So that's going to be posted. And oh, this is a bigger picture of that. Just so you know, we're not. But another, I guess, a, a point I wanted to make here is change over time. Those X's that appear, we don't have to figure out what every X is for, but you can see that there's a progression of some kind there. And that is change in the biological structure of animals over time. A shelled egg to no egg, warm-blooded, uh, parental care, fascinating with vertebrates. You know, there's no parental care with fish and amphibians. They lay their eggs and leave. And they lay hundreds or thousands of eggs. Uh, what is it, the sunfish? Sunfish lays three million eggs and then swims away. <laughs> And I'm going to post this. This was in The Naturalist twice in the past many years. Uh, and I, I brought it here because, so this is biology related to geology in the methow. And what I think is particularly interesting about this is all these terms are de defined. Like, remember Cenozoic. I guess we're in the Cenozoic. I have a hard time reading this. The print's so small. It means new. 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 Zoic, life, new animal life, new animal life, mesozoic, middle animal life, paleozoic, old animal life. They're all, in, they're all interpreted from the Latin into English. They mean more. If you know what they mean, they're easier to remember. So I'm just saying that is going to be posted by noon, I would say. This is for orientation. We're talking about, we're talking about vertebrates today because we, well, what are we leaving out? So this is a new arrangement of life on Earth. They've recently, I'd say in the past 15 years, broken it down into three domains before they break it down into kingdoms. So we're just getting oriented here. Two of the domains are surprising. One is bacteria. It says you bacteria, that means true bacteria. And perhaps a, a surprising one for some would be archaea down there at the bottom. Those are, those are bacterial organisms, single-celled, single-celled organisms 
most of them don't use oxygen. There was no oxygen in the early atmosphere. It's put there by photosynthesis. It's put there mostly by plants and algae, diatoms. So early life didn't breathe oxygen. And how they got by, fortunately, we don't have to deal with. A lot of bacteria do breathe oxygen. There are photosynthetic, that word in the U bacteria at the top, cyanobacteria, those are photosynthetic. They invented photosynthesis, the greatest biological invention since the inception of life, photosynthesis. And then we are located in that upper circle. They call it eukaryota. Unfortunately, it's a big word. Eukaryotes, we are, euka we are eukaryotes. It's a description of our cell structure. Our, the cells of animals are very different than bacterial cells. They're much bigger. Bacteria don't have any nucleus. They're one hundred the size of animal cells, generally speaking. And so that's a tree of those eukaryotes, and you can hardly find us on it. I mean, we're over here, we're animals, so great. But plants, so these are kingdoms, animal kingdom, plant kingdom, fungi, protists. Look at how many protists there are. The protists are much more varied. And then there's this word at the top, chromus. I never heard of it before. <laughs> I looked it up, and then I f found out what it was, but now I forget. Well, we're just orienting here. So we are talking about animals over here, and we're not talking about all the rest of the stuff, and we'll say that some more, because here are, here's something we're not talking about, protists. What are protists? Protists are single-celled organisms, but they have cells like ours. They have eukaryotic cells with a nucleus. So that little purple thing is a paramecium. We remember we've heard of paramecium. Well, it says, it says it's called chaos, but it's related to paramecium. Anyhow. Uh, that yellow thing is a slime mold, and I can never remember. What is a slime mold? Is it a fungus? Well, they're saying it's a protist. It's in this big kingdom called protist. And surprisingly, algae, which are mostly single-celled, are protists. And I think maybe the biggest organisms on the planet, which are some of those big brown seaweeds that wave around in the ocean, they're protists. So... Fortunately, we don't have to deal with that. And I did want to mention diatoms. Diatoms are algae, a form of algae. I think brown algae. They're, they're photosynthetic. They're protists. They're beautiful. They make their houses out of shells. They make their, well, they make their, oh, no. They make their shell out of glass. Look how gorgeous they are. There are innumerable variations. You can just Google them, you know, Google images and get pictures. The one on the right, that I, I call the Coke bottle diatom, looks like a Coke bottle, is uh, Didymo. The fishermen call it Didymo. It's a weed in the Metha River. Um, I know this from our, um, what's his name? Our commercial guy who takes people down the river all the time. Uh, he says it down further down the river, it forms these mats and then they die about in June or maybe after high water and form this white scum. And it's a bit of a problem. I think it's increased because of the increased nutrients in the Methow River because of all the humanity, all the life here and the nutrients from us make their way into the river. Anyhow, one more picture on this page. This is, this is a satellite image of Alaska. If you look at it for a moment, you can see Alaska there. That green in the Bering Sea is a diatom bloom. There are so many billions, trillions of diatoms that they show up in satellite photographs. They're the base of the food chain, not the base, but a base of the food chain in the ocean, especially the Northern Ocean, because they function in cold water. So these single cell microscopic creatures are producing sugar because they're photosynthetic and creating the base of the food chain for all the fish in the sea. It's a big deal and they're beautiful. So we didn't know about the microscopic world because there were no microscopes and Leeuwenhoek, Anton von Leeuwenhoek invented one of the first microscopes, I think in the 1600s. And he started to see these creatures and draw them and became famous for it. And he, one of his students was this guy named Hartzoker and Hartzoker looked at sperm, human sperm. And he saw little homun homun homunculus. He saw little humans. This is a drawing. I don't know if you knew that there are little preformed humans in human sperm. 
and on and all they have to do is get out of there and then you can line them up in a needle like that and they come fully closed people believe this for a short period of time the point he really is everything we know about the world we live in we had to learn we had to learn everything and especially the, the invisible world this microscopic world what people had to invent microscopes we had no idea there were microbes so that's a journey there's an evolutionary physical journey. The earth has changed, life has changed, but the way the human mind functions is also changing. This is a dragonfly emerging from its larval shell. They are aquatic as larva. They live much longer and all these, all these aquatic insects live much longer in the water than they do as adults. Uh, and I just, we're not gonna talk about insects, uh, because they're not vertebrates, but I'm pointing out that they're there and that they emerge from the water. And it, to some degree, they're sort of reliving it as aquatic insects. I'm not saying all insects come out of the water, but a lot of the aquatic ones do emerge. Sorry. And that there's a lot to know about insects. And I think this is the only, I think this is the only other slide on insects, but but these are the bumblebees of the Methow. And I, this is probably posted at the Methow Naturalist website if you wanna get into bumblebees. And the fun, the fun thing about bumblebees is they're barcoded. <laughs> they come in different colors and they're not too hard to identify because uh, of the colors are predictable, more or less. There are variations, but so this does exist. And it's not about bumblebees, it's just there's all these organisms and they all, have lives of their own and they're out there busy doing their thing. This is number of living animal species currently known. So I drew a circle around the vertebrates. There's mammals I can see. Here's my cursor. Mammals, 4,000 species of mammals are the chordates, 38,000. So about 40,000 species of vertebrates on the planet. We'll look at how many other. I mean, we're just a, a hangnail on the rest of animal life there's not that many vertebrates and over here this coleoptera these are beetles so i mentioned the first in the first uh, program that god has a um oh my gosh how's that go uh inordinate fondness for beetles because there are more beetles than anything else on the planet <laughs> vertebrates so we're talking about vertebrates so we're talking about vertebrates in the methow and to some degree not the not the evolution in the methow but but you can see the evolutionary story in the creatures of the methow so we have lamprey in the methow river lampreys are considered the oldest fish on the planet and that is old they are considered to be 360 million years old so that's before any of the geology of the methow remember the the twist formation goes is 160 million years old and the lamprey are 360 million years old the lamprey are older than the rocks. And it, what it says, in my, I was reviewing the notes, it says they haven't changed at all in 360 million years. The fossils are exactly like the organisms now. So they're not the most pleasant creature in the world to look at. This is their sucker mouth. They're parasites as adults. And they are probably particularly, they're parasitic on fish and probably particularly on salmon, mo in the, mostly in the ocean possibly only in the ocean. And they're anadromous, which means that they spawn in fresh water. So they have to run, swim, or wiggle back upstream uh, to spawn and they come to the methow and that means that they have to go over nine dams and they're almost extinct in the methow river. Uh, the larva, so that might not seem like a bad thing, but it turns out all creatures find a place in the ecology of the ecosystems and lamprey are not small players as larva and they are larva i think they're larva for three or four years before they go back to the their larva in the mountain stream and they live in the piles of debris that collect in slow water piles of organic matter they're filter feeders as larva they're larva for four years so they are cleaning up the river in the same way that the uh, mussels, we have mussels in the lower Maha River, they're filter feeders. They're filtering out the organic matter, which has the energy of the sun from photosynthesis. Down in, uh, 
in the hydrocarbon bond, they're filtering that out and they make this water, this incredible meta water we have that is so clear. I just can't believe it every time I see it. The um, lamprey help and the uh, mussels help. And interestingly, both of those groups of organisms are very threatened. Mussels, mussels are, I think, the most threatened group of animals in the United States. Most of the mussel species are on the East Coast and the East Coast water is just hammered. But we do have mussels in the lower Methow. Uh, in fact, the shells come up almost to twist. Uh, people have found shells. We have this frog called tailed frog. Um, it's considered to be the most, one of the most primitive frogs on the planet. And so that's similar to the lamprey. And what are they doing in the Methow? Well, we don't have a good answer for that except that they're here. And we have representatives of the evolutionary journey in the Methow, tailed frog. Uh, they live in mountain streams. The um, tadpoles have suckers on their, on their mouth, a lot like the lamprey, not to suck on animals, but to hold onto the rocks. That's how they hold onto the rocks in fast mountain streams. If you wanna see them, go to Porcupine Creek, which is at um, Rainy Pass. That, that would be the trail to Cutthroat from Rainy Pass. There are a lot of, to turn over rocks and you will see you will see the larva and I just got an email this morning from Libby and Victor and they went up to Por Porcupine Creek at night and there, there were frogs in the water that you don't see during the day. The, the, the closest two frog relatives of the tail frog live in New Zealand. Now how is that possible? <laughs> Evolutionarily how could that happen? The answer to that is uh, uh what do we call the continent you can't answer me because you're all well people are still coming in we're gonna have to go back over everything uh <laughs> pangaea pangaea people say pangaea except me i say pangaea. you know all the continents were joined together 300 million years ago and they broke up starting about 200 million years ago so New Zealand was well, i don't think it was stuck on washington state which actually didn't exist if you remember the geology Washington has appeared terrains over time and lava in the Columbia basalt, but that's why, that's how this is possible. These frogs did not swim through the ocean, but the continents all used to be joined together. And so there's this evolutionary historical footnotes swimming around in the Methow. These frogs are in the Methow, but there's more of them just over the crest. That's why I say they are, they are in Cutthroat Creek, but they're not thick. And in Porcupine Creek, which is just over Cutthroat Pass, there's many of them I'm trying to make it go. Sorry. So this is a mountain beaver. Some of you, if any of you are on the west side, I've, so we don't see mountain beaver, but they're common in the met out in the mountains, in the forested, in the wet places, in the forested trails. And I had to learn how to see their sign. The sign is there are these holes that are about four inches in diameter in the wet places on the trails. So you're walking up a trail and you come to it, it either a creek or it's muddy. You look and there'll be a hole. And the mountain beaver are there. They're quite predictable. And they come all the way down to, they've been seen in Perigen Creek, which is uh, up there on the game range. Somebody saw one running down the road, <laughs> Perigen Creek. They are considered to be the most ancient rodent on the planet. And it's because of the, evolutionary characteristics of their muscles and their skull. Uh, I forget the details. It's just an interesting fact that we have this creature here in the Methow and it's not terribly uncommon throughout Washington, but, but we have evolutionary history here in the Methow. So in terms of evolution, this is a human egg. Fertilized or not, it's still a single cell. And it's just interesting to reflect on the fact all life used to be single cell, it used to be prokaryotic cells, which are bacterial cells. Somehow the cell structure changed into archetype of cell, eukaryotic cell, which has a nucleus and has little organelles, little, little, little things inside of our cells like mitochondria and uh, ribosomes and things like that. We start out as a single cell. Humans start out as a single cell. How is that possible? And how can that cell have the information to make a human. Uh, so life uh, reiterate, life recapitulates the evolutionary journey. And here is some more of that. 
Uh, this is a human embryo at, I think, a week or two, a week or two over on the left, uh, not the poster, but the embryo. And you, you probably know the human embryo early, early in the history of the embryo, we have gill slits and we have a tail and they're, they disappear soon by the third or fourth week, but it's, but life recapitulates the evolutionary journey. Uh, and so we are related to fish and that's poster is a little joke. Embrace your inner fish because you know, we're related. We had, we have gills. I mean, they disappear. And here is a famous expansion of that theme at the bottom of that picture. It identifies what each of those things are. And there's three versions of each creature. So over on the left fish, well, there's a fish at one week, two week, and three weeks, the embryo, embryonic in the egg, in the case of a fish, salamander, one week, two week, three week. The point is look at the first week, they all look the same <laughs> because we're all related. So I have this quote, this is that I can't fully remember, written down and I don't like bothering looking through the notes for it. But I have this note that says uh, creation or creation roughly, to paraphrase it, creationists are upset because now they're saying we're related to monkeys. We're not only related to monkeys, we're related to zucchini. So get used to it. And it's true, we are related to zucchini. Their chemical structure, the DNA is very similar. You could probably insert zucchini DNA in a human gen genome. The age of fish, I forget what this is. Oh, so fish, fish are older than mammals. Fish evolved first, fish, you know, life evolved in the water. Life was single cell, it became multicellular, evolved the structures to more efficiently survive. And so we have these species, we have these beautiful fish in the Methow. This is a picture I was able to take of a sh summer Chinook salmon. I put on a wetsuit. This is unfortunately 15 years ago. This is a female Chinook salmon guarding her red. She's later, she swum up. 550 miles to Witt Road, which is near the Winter Post Office. And if you take Witt Road, you know, that offshoot before you start up the hill as you're heading towards Twist, you go a mile, the river comes to the road, and that's a favorite place for salmon to spawn. And they start spawning on October 1st. They all have little calendars on their watches, and they know what October 1st is. And if you go there on October 1st, there's a shallow place that where the river comes to the road sort of the second time the river comes to the road. There's a pullout by Brandenburg's old house and the salmon spawn there. And that's where this picture was taken. They spawn, they lay their eggs and then they guard their eggs for two weeks. They have not eaten since they entered the, the fresh water two months previous. And so they're programmed to die. And they guard their net, their red, their nest for two weeks so that no other salmon digs it up. And then, they die. Why would an organism be programmed to, to produce offspring and then die? The answer is they're bringing the ocean nutrients back to the mountain streams. They are enriching the river ecosystem. And there used to be 16 million salmon. 16 million salmon. Well, I got a big echo. There. I got a big echo there. And there. And there. I don't know. If, I don't know. If, I don't know. If, I don't, so, so maybe somebody's not muted. It came on. Deirdre, do you have any idea why there's there? It went away. So that's why they're programmed to die. Life and death are integrally interrelated. There's no doubt about that. You could not have life without death. Obviously, you can't. So for fish, we have 26 or 27 fish species. Small argument over three stickleback, three spine stickleback. I forget what it's called, but they were found down at the confluence two years ago. They're not on here. Now, these are just salmonids in the salmon family. And it's just representative to show what salmon we have. I'm always surprised to see that whitefish are, are salmonids. And then that's fish over on the left. And two of them are non-native, brown trout, northern over on the right, it says northern Europe. And down at the bottom, brook trout, they're from Eastern North America. They're in the same genus. So in the second column, you can see the genera as bull trout. Well, you know, bull trout are famous and popular. And they, the brook trout are interbreeding with them and 
creating problems. So it's just uh, one little insight into Well, we're talking evolution here. And somehow, if the evolutionary story is true, and it's easy to doubt that it is, except that the living record and the fossil record is just full of information where you can see the evolutionary story. And one piece of that would be mudskip mudskippers. Mudskippers are fish that come out of the water and spend three quarters of their time out of the water absorbing oxygen through their skin. We don't have mudskippers, but there are 32 species on the planet and they come out to escape predation. That would be a good reason to come out of the water, especially in the early days, there was nothing else on land and to mate. Um, and so we have this evidence of a fish that just walks out of the water and onto land. I hope that the program is working because everybody's face disappeared. This is a spotted frog. It's actually, it's a picture I took at Aspen Lake 20 years ago, and I've never seen this. I heard this sound. I was attracted over to the water to, by this sound, croaking, riveting sound, and there were like 50 frogs. So this is, this is one spotted frog, and in front of the face of that frog is a bit of a circle of eggs. You can make out a circle. That is the, the uh, egg mass from one female. And so we had about 50 females laying egg masses there. You can start to see individual circles. It was a mass egg laying. And as I say, I've never seen it since. And, but the real point here is one female is laying about 200 eggs. How many of those eggs have to survive to replace the parents? And the answer is two. So there's 498 extra, extra eggs and those will become food for the ecosystem you know they'll be eaten as eggs they'll be eaten as tadpoles they'll be eaten as frogs shockingly life lives on itself it's uh, hard. i don't know if it's ever possible to get used to that i did if you go to the meta nasus webpage what shows up on the page is a story by joseph a hindu myth by joseph campbell called how to help people how to help i think it's how to help the world and it's about the fact that life lives by eating itself, which it does. Everything has to eat something else alive every day. Or you can kill it first, but it was alive. You know, it's hard to get used to that fact, but that is the basis of life and it leads to natural selection. So I'm going back to insects for a second because I thought this story was so interesting. The English peppered moth, it should say peppered moth. This is a moth in England. That is, most of the population in the 1800s, early 1800s, was white. There were a few dark forms, but the birds could see the dark ones, see the dark one on that probably birch bark. They could see they would eat the bark, dark ones. And so they would, any genetic um, code for creating dark moths would be eaten by the birds. And the light ones that were camouflaged survived and so 98 percent of the population was light colored and there is a white moth in here and i think i don't know if you can see the cursor i think that's the body right there of the white moth and here's a wing and here's a wing yeah here's a bigger wing yeah that's where it is it's invisible and so it wouldn't get eaten but because of the industrial revolution there was so much soot in the atmosphere the trees started to turn black or dark dark and and biologists were onto it and they found that the population of dark moths started to increase because it was getting, they were more camouflaged on the dark bark and the white moths started to disappear. And it was a living, they could see natural selection in action. And when the scrubbers got on those coal stacks and they cleaned up the, the pollution in England in probably 1900s, early 1900s, then the population went back to white moths. So down at the bottom is natural selection. Parents, they have more offspring than can survive. It's built into the system. Now there is an evolutionary journey there for vertebrates. Vertebrates, as you go up the evolutionary ladder, if I dare call it that, they have fewer and fewer offspring. I mean, humans could have 10, but generally now we have, don't, we have one or two or three or four. Uh, sunfish has three million. <laughs> They're made to be eaten happily. Our children are not made to be eaten. But 
the process of natural. So something is happening. There's an evolutionary journey. And possibly, is it possible? Is it possible that the, that the planet is moving towards compassion? Towards creating a creature that doesn't have to be killed in its youth to live on the planet. It's interesting to contemplate. I'm going field here, but they, it's built in and that's what happens. Parents have more offspring than can survive. They're all different. All the offspring are different because of the genetic recombination. Those that are best adapted to the current environment are the most likely to survive. So what's going on out there? This is what's going on. Eat, survive, reproduce. Eat, survive, reproduce. And this, is, see, this is the evolutionary journey. Fish is coming out of the water like that mud skipper, turns into an amphibian. What are they thinking? Eat, survive. Turn into a reptile, turn into a, uh, a monkey. And then what happens? We get one more creature. <laughs> Homo sapiens comes along, and I think we have a special place. I wouldn't want to overstate the case, but there is no other organism on the planet that's wondering about the meaning of life. I can tell you that. Long toed salamander. So, just so we're going back to our evolutionary journey, a few of our amphibians we have, we have two salamanders, long toed and uh, tiger. And they're totally charming and hard to find. On the back foot there, you can see the long toe that gave it its name. But so the thing about, let's see, yeah, amphibians. Amphibian means two lives. They're born in the water. A lot of amphibians come out of the water as adults. They have to go back to the water to lay their eggs. Here's long-toed salamander eggs. They have to be in the water. No way to lay them out on land. Here is, uh, these are Western toads at Black Pine Pond. There's a pond behind Black Pine Lake. They might want to if you want to ask me where it is, it's a great place. It was a big pond until 18 years ago that had the biggest beaver dam I've ever seen in my life and it broke and it completely washed out the Buttermilk Creek Road because it goes down over Buttermilk Creek. Anyhow, I happened on this scene. These are uh, Western toads laying, this is how they lay their eggs in strings and the, the eggs are fertilized externally. That would be an earlier evolutionary Technique, if you live in water, you can afford to fertilize your eggs externally. If you live out of water, it's not going to work out very well. So uh, the male's on top, they call it amplexus, and he's fertilizing those eggs as she lays them. And she lays, I don't know how many, 500. But she doesn't know, what, it's all programmed. Because as I watched her, you can sort of see just in, off to the left of their snouts, she went up over a grass plant. And the eggs came out of the water and they dried up and died. She didn't know what she was doing. You know, there was, there's a tiny little brain there, <laughs> but she's not thinking. They're just doing what they can to, what they're programmed to do. Uh, and having far more offspring than can survive and those that are best adapted will live. So here's a test. How many amphibians are there in the Meha Valley? Well, there's no reason that most of the people on this list would know that, but you know, it's, it's an interesting question because it's that phenomenon of life outside of our, the circle of our life, of our problems and what we need to get done today. What other organisms live here? And, and they're all interesting and they're all charming. And here's the list. There aren't that many. Oh, I didn't know they were going to come up one at a time. Long-toed salamander, tiger salamander, tail frog. So I showed you long-toed and tailed. Tiger salamanders, they're all great. Western toad, that's the one we just saw that was laying those eggs. Pacific horse frog is the one that makes all the noise in the spring. Uh, much, pretty small little frog. Spotted frog is the one that was in Aspen Lake. And we have the spadefoot toad that lives underground for I would say 11 months of the year. And comes out in the spring and only spawns in temporary ponds, only and swimming pools, because it thinks swimming pools are temporary ponds. I saw them spawn in a swimming pool once. Onward to reptiles. Amphibians have to return to the water. Reptiles don't, because somehow, evolutionarily, through natural selection, they evolved eggs that didn't have to be in water. Eggs that had a hard shell, the shells have to breathe. The, that's those, that, uh, creature inside uh, embryo has to have oxygen, but it can't lose the moisture. So they're like Gore-Tex. <laughs> they're Gore-Tex eggs. They let air in, but they don't 
they won't let, don't let the mus uh, moisture out. So reptiles became a new class of organisms on the planet and multiple, and they could live on land. Prior to that, vertebrates couldn't live on land, large animals could not live on land because there was no way for them to reproduce. So now vertebrates can leave the water and we have this, these evolutionary creatures here in the methow. This is a rattlesnake den at Pipestone. And I just put it in because it's such an incredible picture. And I've only seen this one time. I got a little help from John Rohr and was able to find this. And they, so they come out, this, these snakes, you know, they're, they hibernate and go dormant and their chemical processes slow down to almost nothing. And then they, they come out, various ones of our snakes come out and they lie in piles in front of the den to warm up in the early April sun. And that's what they were doing. They could move and there were two of us there and we got close and they started to move and we backed off, but it was a, quite a fascinating scene. The only turtle in the Methow, the most widespread turtle, but a reptile, interestingly enough, a reptile that went back to the water and lives in the water, but it comes out of the water to lay its eggs on land. I have a garter snake den here at my, on my property near the river, but in the cobbles, they're very dependable. They come out about April 1st every year and they make a huge pile of snakes every year. And it's just quite a sight, two species actually. I only see one in that picture, but there are two species of garter snakes that we have in the methow and they do this scene. And I was looking them up as I was, you know, the, the slide showing, what are you going to say about garter snakes? And I got this story. So they, they come out and they breed in the spring. So a male has evolved the capacity to create female pheromones. And they come out of the den and they lie in the sun. And the other males are attracted to this one male that is creating female pheromones. And he slithers away and the other males follow him. And then he ditches them and he come, the males come out first and he comes back to the den opening and all the females are there and he has drawn the other males away. Uh, and he's able to mate with multiple females because he got rid of the other males. So I thought that was unbelievable. <laughs> oh yeah, there's their heads, they're cute as can be. If you move slow, they, you can get quite close to them. Test, how many reptiles are there in the methow? I don't know if they're gonna come up one at a time, they are. So Western skink has a blue tail. <clears throat> I think, uh, Olga, didn't you send me a picture of a skink? No, you didn't. You sent me a picture of a Western fence lizard. Shorthorned lizards, number four there. That is a horny toad. Remember horny toads from your vacations in Arizona when you were a child? They are the cutest little things. They are up on top of our dry hillsides. There are shorthorned lizards which are fun to call horny toads, and they aren't toads, on Patterson Mountain, up on top. I got a picture from Libby and Victor, who are, you know, exceptional naturalists. They found babies up on, baby horned toads, two weeks ago, up on Patterson Mountain, and they were the size of a dime. Now, how cute would that be? Rubber boa, great snake. We have a snake called a rubber boa. You can wrap it around your arm, and it won't, won't leave. It likes the warmth of your arm. I think that's it. 11. We have 11 reptiles. So these are organisms that, you know, evolve from amphibians, learn to live on land, lay their eggs on land, and have populated the world. And this is how many we have in the methow. But life didn't stop. It wasn't happy with fish, amphibian, and reptiles. And it went on. And turns out that birds evolved from dinosaurs. It's pretty well established that birds are dinosaurs. And many of you who live here in the Methow can now confirm that because what about the turkeys? Do they look like dinosaurs or not? We have these flocks of turkeys. There were no turkeys in the Methow 20 years ago. Now there are thousands of turkeys and they walk around in flocks of 20 to 100 and they look like dinosaurs. It's just incredible. And I'm wondering what impact they're having on the ecosystem. They're introduced but they've done incredibly well. How is there enough food here to feed all those flocks of turkeys? Anyhow, you can see evolutionarily, the relationship is pretty clear. And this is just a scaled foot on a bird, on a chicken, to show you that they're scaled in the same way that reptiles are. Archaeopteryx, this, this, uh, the, this is a flying reptile. 
this, I think it's 160 million years old. It was found in 1860. So the interesting, an interesting thing about that date is the Darwin published his book, The Origin of the Species in 1859, and people complained, well, where are the links between these evolutionary organisms? Where's the links between fish and rep, fish and amphibians and, rep, and reptiles and birds? And a year later, they found this fossil in Germany. And it's a feathered, you could see that, yeah, you can see the feathers in that uh, fossil. But it had the characteristics, I think it had no breastbone to attach the wing muscles to it, probably glided. It was more reptilian than bird. And it was clearly a link, and I think now 10 of these have been found in Europe. So this is what they evolved into. Look at these great birds that we have in the Metau. Some of my favorite birds there. I just love cedar waxwings up on the upper right. Western tanager with a red head. Why would you evolve a red? They live in the green forest. Why would you evolve a red head? You know, it's, it attracts predators. And I think we talked about that with something previously, but male birds often are brightly colored and attract predators. You know, why? That bald eagle is stuck. He got his foot stuck in the crotch of a branch. And I was walking on land near here, near my home, and I found it. It was stuck and it was alive. And I called Kent, and Kent called the smoke jumpers. And they climbed up in the tree and sawed that branch down, and he flew away. <laughs> and then I put up a wash basin in a pine tree because um, Canada geese nest in wash basins up in trees in the Mahou. I don't know why. And that's a great horned owl that took it the first year. And was that ever cute? How many, I think, oh, so the birds are on a continuing evolutionary journey. There's about 10,000 species of birds on the, on the planet. And um, they evolved from reptiles and the evolutionary journey continues. So these are two sister species to, to uh, illustrate the speciation, splitting apart of species over time. They're in the same genus. That means they had the same ancestor. They came from the same ancestor evolutionarily. The, that genus name has that meaning. And you can see how similar they are, but somehow they started living in, they, they divided the physical environment up somehow, either by time or by space. And with this particular, these two species, I would say they divided it by time because we have common, gold, common golden eyes in the Metau in the winter, and we have Barrow's golden eyes here in the summer. There are no common golden eyes here in the, in the summer. They go further north. And so because the two populations were separated over time, they, over time, genetically, every generation is different, they drifted apart. And now they're two species and they don't interbreed. And that's true for many species. There are, a classic example are the three bluebirds in the United States. We have a Western bluebird, mountain bluebird, and Eastern bluebird. They're all the same genus. They look almost exactly the same. The ice, the last Pleistocene ice age, separated into three populations. When the ice melted, they no longer interbreed. Happens all the time. Uh, so this is just a special creature I put in because I like harlequin ducks so much. And they've evolved this uh, stunning character that somebody described that says it looked like they were assembled by a committee of first graders <laughs> pasting together different colors. Ah, here's some white pasted on here, pasted on here. So these are, they're almost anadromous. You know, anadromous is used for fish and I never thought of it for this word, for this animal. They spend most of the year at the ocean. They come, they come up rivers to breed. They don't swim. So I guess, that's, well, anadromous means up running. So it would, you know, you could use it. Uh, they come up to Columbia and they, branch off into the mountain streams and we get them the first week, second week of April, they show up. The males are only here for two months. While the female creates a nest, he, he guards her. Uh, mostly he guards her, the patrim patrimony, <laughs> the fact that he's fathered, sired the eggs and then she raises them and he goes back to the ocean. She raises them, uh, they nest on the rivers and uh, hatch out and they, I've seen the, the uh, 
young in the in the fast water. You know, they're 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 called the current ducks, or I forget. But they 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 like the in the winter they live on the on the rocky ocean coast in that rocky splashing water and in the rivers they live in the rapids they live in the rapids and so you get these little birds that are two weeks old swimming in the rapids interestingly the female so the female molts at the end of the breeding season at the end of the the growing season and she has to get back to the ocean by early september before she molts or she can't fly and she'll le sometimes leave her young who don't molt because they're just growing up and they go to the ocean on their own without ever having seen it or knowing that it exists. And one interesting aspect of that is how the, 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 the way that the genetic code codes for life on the planet, it's integrally tied. It's not separate from the geography of the planet for each species. So this, this like I mentioned, I think last week, maybe I mentioned Bartel Godwit. No, I didn't. It's in Wildlife Sightings in The Naturalist, which is coming out tomorrow. Somebody saw Bartel God, Godwit on the Meha River, not too far from here. Bartel Godwit, they've never been seen in the Meha. I questioned it and the person turned out to be a, an ornithologist from Alaska. <laughs> so I had to accept that she saw Bartel Godwit. They fly nonstop from Alaska to New Zealand. The young, with no map. They never heard of New Zealand. <laughs> it's crazy. Mammals. Oh, look at the time. Mammals evolved. Uh, this is, we don't have too many duck-billed platypuses, but they show the evolutionary connection between birds, reptiles, and mammals. And I forget the particulars, but they do have a bird bill and web feet and fur. And they lay eggs. They're mammals that lay eggs. The heart evolved in an interesting way because one of the evolutionary characteristics is the creatures that evolved more recently are more active. And to be active, you need oxygen. You need oxygen to access the energy in the food that you're eating. And so the heart has grown much more efficient over time and, and evolved from a two-chambered heart, which mixes the, the oxygenated and the deoxygenated uh, blood gets mixed together. It's very inefficient. That's what fish have. Our, ours, uh, because we have uh, four chambers, the deoxygenated blood goes to the lungs and is not mixed. And so that's why we can walk and hike and jog and spend the day active and don't have to sleep all the time. Interestingly enough, oxygen increased over time. This is a graph of oxygen over time. Those are billions of years on the bottom. I'm gonna speed up a little bit because of time. We have about 10 slides left. But this is photosynthesis. I mean, it's an image that represents photosynthesis. Why do we breathe? I find it interesting that, you know, we breathe, but we don't know why while we breathe for oxygen. What's the oxygen for? What's the oxygen used for? I mentioned oxygen is, is the second most electrochemically reactive of all elements, of all 92 elements. I think uh, fluorine is slightly more reactive, but there's not very much fluorine. So it reacts with other elements and in our bodies, it breaks the hydrocarbon bond that was made during photosynthesis. And that hydrocarbon bond has captured the energy of the sun in the bond. The oxygen breaks that bond, recombines with, with uh, the oxygen, with the hydrogen and forms water, but it releases that energy to our muscles, to our bodies. That is why we breathe. And so the, the things, Evolution is a journey and things change over time. And this is the change in energy density, say the amount of energy used by one organism or by a cell, the amount of energy passing through living or living thing or by not living things, by all things over time. So the energy is so not to dwell on it, but animals are more energy dense. That little box over animals shows a great increase in energy density, the amount of energy that animals consume compared to plants, planets, surprisingly stars. Stars are so big 
They have a lot of energy, but they're so big that the energy density is low. Look at what humanity is doing. Brains, the most energy dense organic structure on the planet, but modern society with access to 300 million years of fossil fuels and nuclear energy, far more energy dense. This is part of the evolutionary journey. Mammals, look how varied mammals are from the, I think the smallest mammal is the mouse lemur at one ounce. I don't know if it's smaller than our shrew, but it's tiny. Largest mammal on the planet, blue whale, 150 tons. Unbelievable characteristics of mammals. The hair is to retain the heat and retain the energy so the energy doesn't dissipate, makes us more active. What, uh, what the evolutionary journey has in mind, you'll be relieved to know, I do not know. But shrews are so small, they have to eat all the time. They don't even hibernate, they eat all winter. They're on the interface between the snow and the ground and they find things to eat. We have some species of shrews. The bigger you are, the more efficient your energy processes are. So there's a moose at Roger Lake. Uh, and if we have time, there's some, they're so symbiotic. I, I read a story about all the uh, organisms in a moose's gut that helps it um, break down those willows, it's standing in willows, and release the energy in those plants for its own uses. These are the coyotes at the den that I mentioned in the beginning. And the point is only carnivores, I suppose, that you cannot have carnivores without herbivores. You cannot have herbivores without plants. There were no plants. All of these things have appeared over time. I just put this in because it's so cute I couldn't pass it up. Um, our, our local biologist phoned me and said, one of our local biologists, our fish and wildlife guy, found somebody found two baby squirrels on a trail at Sun Mountain. Do you want them? I said, are you kidding? I want them. And so I got these two squirrels and I raised them with, you know, an eyedropper of milk and they slept in my tennis shoes and they went to river camp and the kids fought over who got to play with them. So mammals of the Mahal, this is a test. So we can't name them. There's too many, there's 72 mammals. How many shrews and moles do you think there are? There's four. So I'd say bats are a surprise. There are a lot of bats in the Mahal. Rabbits and pikas, not very many. There used to be, there used to be a white-tailed jackrabbit here, but it's extirpated, it's gone. But the early colonists talk about it, write about it. Rodents, plenty of rodents. How many monkeys and apes in the Mahal? <laughs> Surprisingly many carnivores. Uh, because they, ha you know, you can't have more carnivores than herbivores. But the, uh, Hoofed animals, there aren't that many hoofed animals by species, but obviously their numbers are high. We have so many deer, there were more. There, this is, uh, this is, these are images. This was in the Meho Naturalist, and you can get it if you want it. In fact, if you ask for it, I'll send it to you by email. But to me, I'm just completely fascinated by the fact 75 species of large mammals that existed 15,000 years ago went extinct by 10,000 years ago in North America uh, at the end of the Ice Age. Uh, somehow, Charles Darwin figured that out and said, we live in a, a land of pygmies compared to where we used, compared to what North America was like 15,000 years ago. Things changed, nothing is permanent. Where did they go? Humans arrived at just that point, just that time. These are those Clovis points that were dug up in East Wenatchee in 1987. What do you need a point that's nine inches long for? You need it to kill large mammals. And there is evidence that the extinctions were human caused, and this is one piece, this is out of a book by E.O. Wilson, but there was not a mass extinction in Africa, and that's what that top graph shows. There are some animals went extinct, but because the animals co-evolved with Homo sapiens in Africa, they knew about Homo sapiens and they didn't. They, they knew how to interact with humans and they did not go extinct. When humans arrived in Australia, that shows the extinction curve. North America, when humans arrived, it says there, you know, 10,000 years ago, earlier in Australia. In Madagascar, almost complete extinction of mammals when humans arrived much more recently. Uh, the, the evidence is that Homo sapiens killed them. Well, so this is a cartoon my father sent me. The judge is passing judgment on this lion who killed something and ate it. And the judge said, you were hungry? 
case dismissed. It's natural. I mean, I'm not saying it's not saying it's okay to drive things to extinction, but the hunger hunger of the close people, you know, the gen, the genetic drives that we all deal with as Homo sapiens, they're natural. And um, the human journey is learning to deal well, effectively, and compassionately with our programming. And we have that capacity. So I think this is the last slide, times the river passing events. I love that quote from 2000 years ago. That's a rock, just a rock because rocks have changed over time. This is a graph of, I didn't show this, I don't think, the growth of continents over time. This is how much things change over time. The evolution of plants over time. What's it all about? I don't know if the little guy comes up here. He doesn't. Uh, we're on this evolutionary journey and we're lucky to be here. I have, there's this wonderful program called, I think it's called Humanity. Uh, it's a video program, four parts it's, or three parts. It's just tremendous. I have a quote that I've come to like from that program. I wrote down several, but one is by a Russian woman and she says, we're alive, so we're happy. Oh, you can't talk to me because you're all muted. <laughs> Dana, thank you. That was amazing. I always learn so much, I'm gonna, but I feel like I need to watch it about four or five times so I can soak it all in. <laughs> I, I charge for second watchings. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Dana? I know some people might need to go and that's fine. Yeah, if you do have a question, you have to unmute yourself. Yes. So Deirdre, when we want to watch it, do we watch it on Meto at home or at metonaturalist.com? You can watch it on a Meto at home's YouTube and I'll send that link out to you all. To make okay. a note of that. Thanks. So I mentioned last week, I, I found out if you go to YouTube, they have a search box. And if you type in Meto at home, then you get all the Meto at home YouTubes that are posted and that's easier. If you don't have the link, you can't find it except that way, but that's an easy way to find it. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I just want to show this to my grandkids. I think they would benefit from it so much. Hmm. If you do, let me know what happens. <laughs> Kids don't like a lot of talking. I can tell you that. <laughs> you need to bring them. You make it so interesting. Bring them a frog, and then they'll be interested. <laughs> so maybe we're finished. Just in the nick. Great. Last chance, anybody want to throw a question out there? I just, I feel like I'm really ignorant, but I, I really didn't realize that the extinction of some of those huge mammals was linked to man. I always thought there were, you know, I knew that there were, they hunted them, but I just never thought about that. Yeah, so it's argued, I'd say the, the, the bulk of the evidence is that the extinctions were largely caused by human sapiens. And an interesting point, around that is that the Native Americans do not like that story. <laughs> because, you know, it doesn't reflect on them, but they think it does. But it is the same people. It is, you know, the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. If the sapiens drove those mammals to extinction, and there are, there are fossil organisms with spear points embedded in them. <laughs> it's just the way it is. On yeah. Planet. Yeah, you have to survive. And Eat breakfast. <laughs> extinctions are happening at a rapid rate right now. Uh, Dana, what, a question? Yeah. Hi, from uh, Bill Kintner uh, over in Port Angeles. Uh, so we have rough-skinned newt uh, over here in just about all of the freshwater uh, bodies of water. It, it doesn't make it over uh, into the valley, though? Uh, they're in Chelan County, but they're not in Okanagan County. Uh, 